On a recent trip across Wyoming, I took some time to look up into the clear night sky, blazing with stars. Far away from city lights, I could see faint dots, which were actually entire galaxies. I could easily see the North Star and the three stars that comprise, comprise Orion's Belt. Orion's Belt appears in more than 30 constellations across many cultures. If I lived in Hawaii and I looked at those stars, I would see the cat's cradle, not Orion. If I was a part of the Ojibwe culture, I would see Wintermaker. And if I was Navajo, I would see First Slim One. The order we impose on the stars, the constellations we see, tell a story about us more than the stars. People are like stars. In this metaphor, you and I are stars. Our communities are constellations. Some stars are brighter than others. Others give us direction, like the North Star. But even the North Star does not connect with every constellation. And I've seen some people try very hard to bend communities to their personal will. Perhaps we'll call those people black holes. <laughs> Government and the people within communities tell two very different stories or see different constellations after disasters. The community constellations tell a story of collaboration and compassion. Government star systems tell a story of command and control. My name is Aaron Titus. I'm the president of Mountain West Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters, or Mountain West VOAD. It is the second largest VOAD in the country, comprising 12 states from Alaska to the Dakotas. I'm the author of How to Prepare for Everything and executive director of Crisis Cleanup a uh, cleanup collaboration platform that has documented nearly $1 billion of voluntary disaster relief services. In these capacities, I've helped coordinate 133 disasters in 40 states, working directly with 1,700 relief organizations and hundreds of emergency managers during their times of greatest stress. I'm also an attorney, graduating from the George Washington University, so it's good to be home. My wife, Jennifer, and I are the proud parents of nine children. Yes, nine. Uh, so I never stop training for disasters, even when I go home. <laughs> I hate disasters, but I love to see communities self-organize and watch humanity shine, like the stars coming out after the clouds have cleared. Look carefully, and you'll see that our communities have already organized themselves. They have their own constellations. You don't need to impose order. Yet we have trained emergency management and law enforcement to look into the community after disasters and see a pyramid constellation where they are on top. Rebecca Solnit has observed that many believe if they are not in control, the situation is out of control. Or if they don't impose order, the sky will fall. While bad things will happen and people will die, the sky does not fall even after the worst disasters. However, disasters are, by their nature, overwhelming. If it isn't overwhelming, we call it an inconvenience, or perhaps an emergency, but not a disaster. And yet, our entire response paradigm is built upon the concept of control. This bias manifests itself throughout ICS and government response structures. Consider several states ESF 15 or 17, Volunteers and Donations Management. First, it's called Volunteer Management, not Empowerment or Engagement. Second, anyone who has worked with Volunteers and Donations knows that the only thing they have in common is that they are messy things emergency management's wishes would go away. Emergency management can control many things, but at a certain point, the disaster and the community it affects becomes fundamentally uncontrollable. We train emergency managers to control an emergency. Then we ask them to control a disaster. It's like we give them the tools to dam a stream, then tell them to stop the tide. Just as absurd as controlling the tide, it is also absurd to think that we can control the people within the community and their natural human desire to help a neighbor. Turning them away can have devastating consequences. During Hurricane Sandy, 1,000 homes flooded in a New Jersey town. I offered thousands of volunteers to help clean up, but the city had locked down and kept all relief organizations out. Weeks later, the city finally opened up, 
but would only accept 10 volunteers to help run, operate the chipper to help clean up the park. This decision cost residents roughly $10 million. After Hurricane Irma, a colleague of mine had a chainsaw accident that required him to be evacuated by a helicopter. Although he made a quick and full recovery, emergency managers shared that story as a warning about letting volunteers help. But for the cost of one accident, his organization saved 5,000 households roughly $13 million. Our frameworks do not consider the benefits of community engagement. Communities do work government cannot. Each group has its own responsibilities, resources, expertise, and authorities. We must recognize and respect our different stewardships. Government stewardship often ends where private property begins. Emergency management stewardship includes coordinating rescue, restoring public infrastructure and basic services, and applying for federal assistance. But the community does not wait patiently on the sideline for someone to signal that the response is over and recovery has begun. Neighbors rescue neighbors. They evacuate friends, family, pets, and livestock. They engage in donations management. They provide emotional and spiritual care, even when refused entry into official resource centers. The American Red Cross has a humanitarian stewardship to provide mass care and immediate sheltering. Many faith communities have an independent stewardship to help the widow muck out her private property. Government doesn't have the capacity to know, much less control, the whole community response. Let communities lead themselves and focus your limited energies on the stars without a constellation. The typical emergency manager I encounter is experiencing his first largest and last disaster. And yes, the industry is male dominated. Without much practical experience, they must rely on their training to know how to interact with others. We set our emergency managers up for failure in this respect. Because ICS is infused with a command and control philosophy, it almost requires emergency managers to interact with others as though their ego is in charge. One thing they don't teach at the Emergency Management Institute, but really should, is how much energy community organizations and volunteers must spend stroking emergency managers' egos and, and flattering their command and control worldview simply to ensure they don't stonewall humanitarian missions. We currently train emergency managers that theirs is the only, or at least the most important, community stewardship. Instead, we must train them to recognize and honor the stewardship of other community actors. There is no single all-encompassing community constellation. Communities have many centers. They are polycentric. We must adapt our models, our constellations, to reflect reality. The path to adapting our models is to understand how communities actually work. There are four universal laws that govern communities. First, there is no pyramid, and you are not on top. This law is true for everyone during all phases of disaster relief, especially if, if you believe that you are an exception. The subject came up at a state VOAD meeting where dozens of relief organizations and four emergency managers met together. One of them stood up and told the relief organizations, you all need to get your act together and provide us a single point of contact. I shook my head and he asked why. I replied, there are four counties represented in this room. In a disaster, which one of you is in charge? Instinctively, two of, of the emergency managers blurted out, well, I am, <laughs> while the other two gave me confused looks. I explained, there are several reasons why my question does not make sense, so I'll make you a deal. The day you all can get your act together and provide a single point of contact to the VOAD, we will do the same. What you ask of us is impossible for the same reason it's impossible for you. There is no pyramid and nobody is on top. But you might ask, what about emergency support functions? Everyone important has a place in the pyramid. Is, doesn't ICS already solve this problem? To that I would respond, yes. Life would be much easier if everyone in the community just 
did it your way and followed orders? <laughs> or would it? Does your staff really have the capacity to give that many orders? Can you really control the tide? This brings me to the second universal law of communities. Volunteer means you're not the boss of me. <laughs> Neither you nor anyone else may be as in charge as you've been trained to believe. For example, the sheriff's department can order me out, but they can't order me in. The power company coordinates with, but does not report to government. The American Red Cross doesn't tell the Salvation Army what to do. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints doesn't tell the Southern Baptists what to do, as my Baptist colleagues are happy to remind me. But then again, most Baptists I know don't let other Baptists tell them what to do either. <laughs> Even an emergency manager has no jurisdiction over how a Methodist minister per performs a disaster relief ministry. Another reason communities fall outside of any command structure is a competitor cannot tell another competitor what to do, which is the third universal law of communities. On the surface, this seems intuitive, but we attempt to violate this law all the time. In government, the command and control approach would seem to sidestep the problem of competition by establishing unity of command. Now, perhaps in your jurisdiction, the guns and hoses always get along. Perhaps your elected officials really can do your job just as well as you. <laughs> the city and county never disagree, and the state is always there, ready to support the local needs of counties. And thank goodness for the feds, bless their hearts. <laughs> now, in reality, each of our organizations has competing interests, even within the same command structure. Sometimes those interests align, like the stars. Other times they are as separated as the North Star and the Southern Cross. To illustrate, please raise your hand if you have never experienced another government agency or community organization try to exert control over you by leveraging money, data, or the color of law. Any hands? No? That's a pretty consistent response. <laughs> if the third universal law of communities is a competitor cannot tell a competitor what to do. Then the fourth law is, we are all competitors. And it's time we acknowledge that fact. It is healthy to recognize competition in a polycentric world instead of glossing over this reality with euphemisms like partnership. We each have something that others want, and we all want something others have. Volunteers want access behind the perimeter. Emergency managers want control over community resources. Agencies want authority and funding from one another. Elected officials want credit. We compete for grants, mind space, brand, and volunteers. While there are few winners in this perpetual power struggle, the primary losers are the survivors we serve. In the VOED movement, we espouse four ideals called the four C's. Cooperation, communication, coordination, and collaboration. It's not that we're any better at any of those things than anyone else. If the four C's came naturally, we would not need an organization devoted full time to their promotion. <laughs> We've just learned through painful experience that we must work together, at least to some minimum degree, to accomplish our missions and overcome the fifth silence C that does come naturally, competition. While the four C's are foundational, they don't actually make disaster response happen. For that, you need the four R's of disaster relief. They are in order of importance, relationships, resources, roles, and responsibilities. Implemented backwards, the four R's can have catastrophic effects. Responsibilities without roles yields confusion. Roles without resources leaves you with impotence and resources without relationships produces dysfunction, infighting, and backstabbing. Relationships drive communities. Our failure to train emergency management to develop and maintain community relationships sets them up for failure after a disaster. Emergency managers who have been battle-tested or live in very poor communities seem better equipped to foster relationships often in spite of their training. 
They understand that partnership means a relationship between interdependent equals, whereas others use the term euphemistically to mean a resource I can task. Relief organizations will truly be equal partners with government the day emergency management can call itself voluntary support function one with a straight face. <laughs> partnership can feel like you're giving up control, but true partnership does not reduce control because you didn't have it to begin with. Let the community lead. Communities and people heal faster when they help themselves and each other. Even during response, work yourself into the constellations that your communities have drawn before imposing your own. You will see those constellations easier when you understand the four universal laws of communities. First, there is no pyramid and you are not on top. Second, volunteer means you're not the boss of me. Third, a competitor cannot tell another competitor what to do. And fourth, we are all competitors. It's time to help emergency management and government officials interact with the whole community using the integrity of relationships rather than the personal ego encouraged by command and control systems. And if you believe that ICS describes the way that communities actually work, then you do not understand the essence of community. To that end, it is past time to develop an incident response framework that can allow communities to organize themselves while permitting ICS to function in the government sphere. Please remember, communities already help themselves during all phases of disaster. Our frameworks just need to catch up with that reality. This new framework would consider the benefits of whole community engagement and acknowledge that all communities are polycentric collections of stewardships. Government is one of many centers. This whole community framework would permit coalitions of competitors to transparently work together around shared interests. It would also describe non-hierarchical interactions during the entire recovery cycle, rather than just command and control relationships during the response phase. The word disaster originates from the Latin dis and astro, meaning a misfortune blamed on a bad alignment of stars or planets. The literal translation of disaster is without a star, which seems poetically appropriate. When your community finds itself in a disaster and you feel as though the, the sky will fall, please remember it is not your responsibility to hold up the heavens. Instead, if you will let them, the constellations of your communities will orient you and give you direction and support. Let the community lead. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I would say, first of all, just begin by seeing the community in a polycentric way. Once you begin seeing that, and that, that way of seeing it will govern your interactions with others. Uh, it, the moment you start seeing yourself at the top of a pyramid, and then everyone becomes a resource that, to be tasked, and, and that's the way command and control systems in general work, whether you're talking ICS or any of its analogs. Um, the closest thing was in 2011, FEMA promulgated the whole community doctrine. Uh, but if you read that, even that doctrine is extremely government centric. And I mean, uh, in, in some ways, I, I know that I'm coming at this from a almost controversial perspective. But the fact that a community centric view of disasters is off the beaten path or even controversial itself is at the core of my critique. So I'm an attorney, and uh, with my lawyer hat on, I, I've come to the conclusion that you don't become partners by begging. You come to the relationship from a position of strength. In my work with crisis cleanup, for example, so I, I mentioned those three clubs we bash each other over the head all the time with money, uh, data, and the color of law. Um, the color of law is, uh, belongs exclusively to government. 
Um, the private sector doesn't have the, it, or at least you know, nonprofits don't have money, not like the government does. The government doesn't have enough, uh, but they have more. But we have data. And when we finally get our act together, that data is powerful. And I, I believe that that is one path forward to renegotiating some of the response culture. I'll give you a, a simple example. Right? Um, just because, as a faith community leader, just because I perform a disaster relief ministry after disaster, I am browbeaten into giving the state and federal government my, uh, my membership list. Right? Give me all your volunteers, give me all your hours, give me all your hours, give me all your hours. Tell me everything about them, and I want to know where they were and other names and everything. Well, there are other ways to do that. And I see data as a way for the voluntary community to come to the table and say, we have this thing of value. You may have it under our conditions, and we're going to renegotiate the response culture in this country. It's a lot of what I do with my crisis cleanup hat on. Right? It's, it's to, I have a lot of somewhat terse conversations with emergency managers across the country who uh, you know, believe that you, know, you have data, therefore it is mine, and I have to inform them that no, it really belongs to the community, and you need to de develop relationships with the community first before, if you, if you want that information. I found it isn't actually all that hard once you simply open your eyes and start to look. Once you start, it's like when you, the first time you look up into the sky looking for the Big Dipper and you see it. And once you see it, once you're looking for it, it's not that hard to see. Now, having said that, um, you know, in my experience, your, your community brokers, um, they're the people who have one foot in more than one community. Like one of those constellations up on the screen had a, had a shared star between constellations. And those community brokers, those are the people that you're really looking for, um, who understand, you know, maybe have one foot in, in your constellation and another foot in another constellation, whether that's a minority community or faith communities or um, schools or clubs. Uh, and all you need to do is just show up, like, uh, just show up, and you'll begin to see the influencers. So that is actually the topic of my book. <laughs> uh, and uh, what I would say is we, <clears throat> we need to stop preparing, this is, might not sound intuitive, but we need to stop preparing for disasters. When we prepare for disasters, we focus, first of all, there's infinite number of things that, that, can, bad, that can happen, and we can't prevent them. If we could, we'd make sure that nothing bad would happen. And when we focus on them, it creates fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That has all kinds of side effects. It's, com it's complex, and so now all of a sudden to navigate preparation, um, we need an expert, uh, uh, somebody from the Red Cross or somebody with a badge or something to tell us what to do because we're so overwhelmed. Instead, we can prepare for disruptions, not disasters, and we can prepare together. So, so disruptions to uh, uh, power, water, sewer, shelter, property, and instead of engaging in these pseudo risk analyses, otherwise known as guessing, like should I prepare for a hurricane or a flood or a fire or a tornado, ask, has your power ever gone out? Yes. Well, let's prepare for a power outage. Now, it doesn't matter whether the power outage was caused by a flood, fire, backhoe, or grandma backing into a pole. If you prepare for a few disruptions, then it doesn't matter what disaster comes your way. Once you start thinking in that mindset, now all of a sudden we don't need experts to tell us what to do. We're preparation experts. We just, we're all preparation experts. We just lack a framework to organize our thoughts. And once we give people the framework, they can prepare, and we prepare better when we prepare together. And the act of preparing together builds community resilience and those relationships, so they're more likely then to rely on their neighbor or also see themselves as a resource to their neighbor when the bad thing happens. You know, applying these, 
uh, applying these principles, let's say after Hurricane Harvey, right? So we all coordinate with hundreds of relief organizations and they'll come to me, hey, Hurricane, well, in fact, today it was Imelda, Imelda. So I, I have to put my, my phone is on uh, mute right now because my phone's ringing off the hook uh, from people in Texas saying, hey, Aaron, we're gonna, we're gonna start coordinating and collaborating as a community. Can you get the system up and running and can you get the hotline up and running? So I'll open up a hotline and those are all, and then because of relationships, um, we'll work with, let's say, a dozen relief organizations and volunteers from their homes that will answer those calls from the public and their homes. They'll put that information on a shared map that is shared among all the relief organizations that want to do cleanup, for example. And then organizations that have capacity can claim that case, contact the homeowner, and then go complete it and mark it complete. So everybody can see what everybody else is doing, but there is no single organization on top. Um, there's no assign button, there's only a claim button because voluntary means you're not the boss of me. And so once you understand like those basic principles, the solutions, I don't know, kind of write themselves, right? You just, it's, it's really about basic human respect um, and, and respecting each of our stewardships and recognizing that they exist.